going on an adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came a tumbling down. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came a tumbling down. Joshua, you know the tune, but do you know the man? Did this great biblical general even exist? Here's the story. And it starts with Moses. Moses! The Bible says Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. Moses died. Joshua took over. Moses is dead. Go now and cross the Jordan River. You will lead the people to take possession of the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. In a series of great battles, he conquers Canaan the land God promised the Israelites. What does that mean to you? Well, without Joshua, there'd be no conquest. And no conquest means no Israel. No Israel, no Judaism, no Jesus. No Jesus, no Christianity. You get the picture. So who was this guy? General, saint, villain, myth. We've got three clues to find our man. One, archaeology. Two, literary sources. Three, believe it or not, the miracle. First things first, if you want to know Joshua, forget Jericho. The real story, the real battle, and the real archaeology is somewhere else. We're going to one of the most amazing archaeological sites in the Holy Land to start our search for Joshua. We're going to Hatsor, that's H A. Z-O-R, or H-A-T-Z-O-R, is mentioned in the Bible as one of the cities, one of the main Canaanite cities that was destroyed by Joshua when he conquered uh, Canaan, when he conquered this land. Now, there's a big debate. The biblical city of Hazor emerges from the dust of antiquity as archaeologists uncover silent remains of its glory. I got it. Look, look at it. This is very old. Workers carefully chip away at crusts of time. Some of these ruins belong to the 18th century before Christ. It was Joshua who conquered Hazor, capital of Canaanite kingdoms. Canaanite inscriptions still remain on some of the stones. Hazor was lost, won, and lost again by the Israelites, who left remains of their everyday life intact after many centuries. Solomon rebuilt the town, and today the biblical city of Hazor is making history again. The Bible says, Joshua 11.10, and Joshua at that time turned back and took Hatsor and smote the king thereof with the sword. For Hatsor, before time, was the head of all those kingdoms. Was Joshua real? Was he a mythical figure? Did he really conquer this land? A lot of people say he's totally a mythical figure. Hatsor wasn't destroyed by Joshua. How do you figure it out? Well, you dig at Hatsor. Look at this place. Just look at it. Professor Amnon Bentor is our guide. Professor, what, what do we do? I'll tell you, I'm already arguing with Professor Amnon Bentor, and we haven't even started the interview. And you've been here, this is Hatsor. This is one of the biblical sites that's been excavated. No. No? No. Yeah. Hatsor is not mentioned in the Bible? It is. But oh. you, you just said it is one of the biblical sites. No. So what do you mean? It is the biblical site. It's the biblical <laughs> exactly. site. I'm sorry. Exactly. I stand I stand corrected. It is right. the and you'll tell us. Well, okay, what? I'll tell you why. why? No, no problem. Yeah. Uh, there's no other side. If you want conquest 
Okay? Conquest. Yes, Joshua, no Joshua. If you want to tackle conquest. The conquest of Canaan, of, of Canaan by Joshua. Canaan by the Israelites, it's Hatzor. This you, is the place. Now, I don't say you have to agree about everything. You don't have to agree about uh, the conquest. You don't have to agree, but this is the place to have the argument. This okay? is it. That's this why I'm having it. this argument with okay. you here. So, there's no other Imagine Hatzor, more than 3,000 years ago, a great palace, pagan altars, soldiers, priests, families, children, a king. Hatzor, head of the Canaanite kingdom in the Galilee. To conquer this land, Joshua needed to lop off that head. As the Bible says, Joshua's army reached Hatzor and they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe and he burnt Hatzor with fire. The Bible says Joshua burnt this Canaanite city. But what's the evidence? In ancient days, there was a wooden floor here? Yes, there was. I'll show it to you. Not this one. I'll show it to you. Oh. Are we going? Yeah, we're going. You want to see wood? Come, I'll show you. You see the base? The stuff. What did it the whole, All the walls are lined by basalt slabs. Wow. Okay. okay. Wow, look at this basalt. Wait. Can, I, can I take a piece? Come here, come here. You see the line of little stones yes. above it? Do you see the black line? I see the black this line. This is the burnt wood. Wow. You see it? I see it clearly. That's it. That's the burnt floor. We're talking about a big fire. A lot of wood, a lot of olive oil, because we have at least 20 huge pithoi. Pithoi meaning jars. Huge jars, each one of them more than 200 liters, which were all burning, because we have the lines of burnt oil still seen on the outer face of the jars. And we have what we don't have now, fortunately, very, very strong winds. The combination of strong winds, oil, and wood would create temperatures that are double the temperature of a normal fire. A normal fire is six, 700 degrees centigrade. We had a fire here that was at least 1,300 degrees centigrade. Wow, so it, it would kind of melt everything, right? If you'll come and look at the mud brick, you'll see that the mud brick melted. It looks like lava. Look at it. Here? Yeah. To be able to melt them like this... You need more than 1,300 degrees centigrade. 1,300. So this is just... It's this is an unbelievable fire in which this palace perished. Okay, but things don't get destroyed in... 13... By accident. By accident, no. right? Somebody torched it. Somebody torched it. Yeah. Okay. Does this bit of melted mud brick authenticate the biblical story, our first piece of evidence in the search for Joshua? <laughs> Please help me stop the Israelites before they burn Hazor and slaughter all our people. Sincerely yours, King Jabin of Hazor. You're holding in your hands evidence to the destruction of the palace of Hatzor in the middle of the 13th century. Does this bit of melted mud brick prove Joshua burnt Hatzor over 3,000 years ago? You dig at Hatzor and you find the ash where and when the Bible says it should be. But did Joshua do it? Not everyone thinks so. I'm on my way to meet Carl Ehrlich, professor of religious studies at York University. We're trying to find Joshua, the man behind the myth. But Ehrlich thinks we might be looking for the wrong man. He wonders, is Joshua actually the same guy as Moses? A sort of literary clone. There is a character named Joshua who we encounter in the Hebrew Bible, a character who arguably is modeled on that of Moses literarily, although some people perhaps would argue that the character of Moses and the Moses traditions are modeled on Joshua. It's one of these chicken or egg questions. And part of the suspicion you have is that their tales is, are too similar. Moses leads the Israelites across the Reed Sea where the waters part. Joshua leads the Israelites across the Jordan River where the waters part. 
uh, Moses um, encounters God or an angel of God at the burning bush and is told to take off his sandals because the ground upon which he is standing is holy. Joshua encounters an angel of God uh, outside Jericho and is told to take off his sandals because the ground upon which he is standing is holy. No, I can see, I'm a hockey fan. I'm a hockey fan and I can see that in the future, PhDs, people will get their PhDs on the yeah. following. They'll, they'll see that there were two, these two legendary hockey figures, one named Bobby Orr and right. another named Wayne Gretzky. And they couldn't possibly be real people because they both grew up skating as little kids on ice rings in Canada. Sometimes clearly what they both had than fiction. hockey sticks. They both had, you know, they both, they clearly are the same figment of somebody's imagination. Maybe there was some Wayne Gretzky, the maybe there was some Bobby Orr, but they couldn't both be hockey players who were the greatest. Somebody made them up. And since we have no archaeology, the actual skates, they probably didn't exist. Um, Somebody's going to have a PhD in Gretzkology. Moses and Joshua. The same person? It's a literary theory. Here's the logic. Joshua needs authority. So borrow some from Moses. And you do this by making their stories mirror each other. Archaeology can't prove it one way or the other. Oddly enough, we're on more solid ground. We find more archaeology when we turn our attention from men to gods. The Bible says, Joshua smote his enemies with the edge of the sword. And what do we got here? We've got Canaanite gods, one of them a god or a worshiper of gods with his head lopped off. But this guy's head was taken right off by somebody with a very big sword. Who did that? Well, they say they don't know if there was a Joshua or not. One thing that they do know is that the Bible says that when Joshua came through Hatzor, he burned it, he destroyed it, he went after the Canaanite gods. This is exactly the kind of stuff that Joshua and the incoming Israelites did not like. They cut these things down, they toppled them to the ground. And then guess what? That's exactly how the archaeologists found them, toppled to the ground in a destruction layer. That was different than other cultures because polytheistic culture, pagan culture, was accepting of many gods. But here you had a revolution, according to the Bible, a revolution, one God, a God that didn't tolerate the worshiping of stones, of standing stones, and of gods and goddesses. So we have plenty of evidence of gods, but our man, Joshua, is a shadowy figure. The Bible's full of his stories, but most of his exploits wouldn't leave any evidence for us to find. Here's Joshua's problem. He's famous because he won battles and that means destroying things. He didn't build things for us to find, he knocked them over, or burnt them, or put them to the sword. Joshua 6.21. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and asses with the edge of the sword. Other stories give us better clues as to whether or not our man existed. The Bible says Joshua conquered 31 cities, including Hatzor, Jericho, Jerusalem, Lachish, and Megiddo. Many of these places can still be found today. Professor Finkelstein studied a number of them. He says there's no way Joshua conquered all 31 cities because 3,200 years ago, some of these cities didn't exist. When we come to Joshua, we see, one, that many of the sites mentioned in the book of Joshua regarding the conquest of Canaan in the supposedly in the 13th century BC had not at all existed at that time. It didn't exist at the time of Joshua. I mean, there, was, there is no I at the site of I, and there is no Arad at the site of Arad. 13th century, I'm speaking about 13th century. If you take the list of conquered cities in Joshua 12, and, or in the, in the stories themselves, and you compare the list, you know, to what we know today from archaeology, you take, you get two completely different stories. Completely. The archaeology the, says one thing. I mean, most of the, the Bible says most of the places were not inhabited in the had not been inhabited in the late Bronze Age. But is Professor Finkelstein looking in the right time? Consider this. Future archaeologists search for evidence of World War II in 1945. No problem. 
what if they get the date wrong and look in 1925? Misjudged 20 years, World War II disappears. If we want to find Joshua, we need to know where, yeah, where, where, and when to look. Difficult questions, but here's an easy one. How does a broken pot and a miniskirt help us to date Joshua? We're looking for Joshua, but how do we decide which year to find him in? Well, we use a broken pot and a miniskirt. I see this year. One of the most important means to assign a date is pottery typology. Pottery changes over time. Pottery changes rather quickly because it's, it breaks, because it's cheap to make. So once it breaks, you make a new one and fashion. It's like fashion, future, future archaeologists will be able to tell by... Uh, by models by, of cars. By cars. By cars, by dresses. One year, all the women go with short dresses. Another year, they go with long dresses. But then they go to short dresses now, again, and, and then, that confuses future no, archaeologists. No, 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 but, but then you put it together with something else. The short dress, the long dress with this type of car. You have to match and, it all up. And once you get, you get a starting point, you go with it, OK? Both Professor Bentor and Professor Finkelstein try to solve parts of Joshua's puzzle with bits of broken pottery, but reconstructing the past is a humpty dumpty task. All the king's horses and all the king's men don't always agree on what goes when. Think about it. We're trying to tell a story, a tale of heroes, villains, battles, and conquests, but our clues are bits of smashed pottery, 3,000-year-old smashed pottery. And if that sounds tough, how can we tackle Joshua's miracles? The book of Joshua says walls fall when a trumpet sounds, the sun stands still, the river Jordan parts. But consider this question. Do some of the things we call miracles have natural explanations? We've got these stories that, that include aspects of the miraculous, of the superhuman, that the archaeological record cannot comment on one way or the other. March all of your soldiers around the city once a day for six days. Have seven priests carry seven rams, horn trumpets in front of the ark. How very unusual. Quite. On the seventh day, blow the trumpets and the whole army must utter a war cry. Then the city walls will collapse and the men can charge straight in. Do you think he was a real person? Do you think he actually I have conquered absolute, Jericho? Uh, probably not, but you never know. Or if he conquered Jericho, it certainly wasn't the way it's depicted in the Hebrew Bible. And uh, there, Why there's not? a certain Why not? You know, we just, experienced, well, well, we just experienced this tsunami that killed a quarter of a million people, OK? Walls of water came on people. Now, it could be that if we didn't have, you know, all these news and photographs and everything, that people later would say, walls of water, a quarter of a million people, impossible. No, Why, it to, must be mythological. Why do you assume that it didn't happen? Jericho is an earthquake zone. They marched around, they tooted their horn, an earthquake came. You can argue about okay, why but, did it come? Was it just a coincidence? But you see, why don't, don't, you see, don't you see what you're doing? In your attempt to preserve the literal text of the Bible, you have just added something that is not mentioned in the Hebrew Bible and Which doesn't is appear. What? An earthquake. It, there no, is it no, does. It there's says it no shook mention. The ground. All kinds of weird things happen around the, uh, Joshua's time, according to the Bible. The sun stood still, the, the, the Jordan River got blocked up. That happens constantly. It's been documented scientifically. That the that sun stood the, still? No, that, the, that <laughs> the, the, river, the Jordan River gets blocked for days on end because of uh, earthquake activity and because of, of rocks falling into the thing. It so happens. So in other words, you're, so in other words you're a Velikovskian. You have a catastrophic Oh, for idea. those who don't know, that's a big insult. <laughs> Emanuel Velikovsky, 1950s academic who said, comets caused the biblical plagues. Scientists called him a crackpot. Since then, scientists have come to accept that comets have caused catastrophes, like wiping out the dinosaurs. 
So could other natural disasters be at play in Joshua's tale? Is there any way we can explain some of Joshua's miracles based on natural phenomena? Dr. Charles Pellegrino is a scientist with a taste for disaster. Sodom and Gomorrah, Pompeii, Atlantis. The Bible says when Joshua conquered Israel, Canaan, the Jordan River stopped flowing and he crossed over. They came to Jericho, they blew their ram's horns and the walls came tumbling down. Skeptics come and say, this is mythology, I don't even have to investigate it. You come and say, sorry, it's, it's geology. Yeah, we know it's a tremendous earthquake zone. A couple times a century, there's a quake, which also affects Jericho even today. And you get these landslides, and for a, up to a day or two, the river no longer flows because there's an artificial dam along the Jordan Valley. And here you have an association with the tumbling of Jericho's walls uh, that the river stopped flowing. Let's sum up for a moment. We've looked for Joshua in miracles, in literary theory, in archaeology, and it's time to return to where we started, Chatzor. Does Professor Bentor think Joshua is the culprit, the one who burnt Chatzor? Why can't it be that simple? because you may have all kinds of alternative explanations. Such as? Such as X destroyed Chatzor. Mr. X? X, uh, give me whoever Egyptians, you want. Egyptians, yeah? Assyrians. And the Israelites, 500 years later, say, you see, we did it. It was my granddad. Because in order to be sure of what you are saying, we need to find a sign here saying, I, Joshua, conquered Chatzor, just like it says in the Bible. Since I believe this is never going to happen, it will be from now on a matter of common sense. You said it will always be a matter of common sense. What does your common sense tell you? The Egyptians never claim that they destroyed Chatzor. The Philistines never claim, and they don't claim anything, but the Philistines were never here. It was too inland, and we never find any, even one Philistine portrait here. Uh, the Canaanites, which Canaanite city was uh, capable of destroying Chatzor? So who is left but a conglomerate of people, Bedouins of various kinds, if you wish, who destroyed Chatzor? And many, many, many years later, they were called Israelites. It is an option, logical, but I cannot prove it. Did Joshua lead those Israelites? Most evidence speaks to Joshua's role as conquering general, righteous destroyer. But evidence of his creation surrounds us. From Joshua came Israel. From Israel, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and so much of our world's culture. You can argue myth or man, but there's no denying Joshua's legacy.